If you have a Bible or a Bible app, join me in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I was thinking about um, this message today and what to call it. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times I don't tell you what the title of the message is. I just bring the message that God puts on my heart. Sometimes I, I give it a title though. In fact, I give all of them a title and that's, that's how I know where they are in, in, my, in my, uh, my notes. I have all my notes. I keep all of them or most of them. Uh, I print them out about this size. They fit in my Bible so that, so that I'm not carrying around big pieces of paper and everything. But I put a title on them so that I can go back. I've got them not only printed out for Sunday mornings, but I also have them digitally on the computer and on the thumb drive. And I can go back and I can reference those and I can pull it up. Like I can go back and pull up Mother's Day. By the way, that's another announcement, guys and kiddos. Next week it's Mother's Day. Don't forget. Uh, be prepared. Um, thought about today's message and giving it one of two different titles. One is another look into the mirror. But the other one is 15 minutes to go. 15 minutes to go. And I'm going to share a story with you about that. We were doing a wedding here at the church one uh, weekend. It's been a few years back. And um, I want to say it was for Susan Lindley's daughter. And... Uh, you know how it is when you're putting a wedding together. You know, you plan and you decorate and you get everything just right. It's got to be just right. You want everything to be perfect. Okay? It's your wedding. And so they had done that. They had decorated the church. And they had set things up in the fellowship building for afterwards. And, and she was in, I believe they were using, um, they were using maybe the, um, the nursery in there for the bride's room so she could get ready. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, uh, how many of you know that weddings are hardly ever on time? Hardly ever. Um, there's always something that comes up or something you didn't think about or something that you got to check again, something, something, mm -hmm. something. Well, you know, I was performing the, the ceremony and the guys were all ready. And everything and but the ladies in the bridal party including the bride they were continuing to get ready and uh, I looked at the clock and I looked at my phone I looked at the time and I went to the door 15 minutes to go now when you hear those words and you're the bride and you feel like you've got 30 minutes worth of stuff left to do and you hear 15 minutes to go, you know what happens. You just, you start to get a little frantic. And uh, long story short, we did go just a little bit late with the wedding, but we had the ceremony and, and they are happily married and um, got a little boy together and everything's going good. But 15 minutes to go, it's kind of that, okay, it's almost time. It's almost time. It's almost time. I bring that up because I feel like these messages that God's been giving me here lately are a little... we got minutes left. We don't have much time left. We don't have much time before He's going to come. You realize, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are His bride. The Bible says that. We are the bride of Christ. That means there's going to be a wedding. The scriptures talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's going to be a great feast. There are people who've had visions of heaven. There was one lady, I believe, she, she had a near-death experience where she said she saw heaven and she saw the banquet tables of heaven and everything was set up and was ready. If it's ready, it can't be much longer. Amen? Amen. And because of that, God is wanting us to check the mirror one last time. He wants us to make sure everything's right. He wants us to make sure we're doing what we think we're doing. Listen, not everybody is doing what they think they're doing. I'm not making any accusations, but it, you know, not just in the church. There are people in different parts of society that they're busy and they have, they have an agenda and they're doing things, but they're not doing what they think they're doing. Okay, God wants us 
to look at ourselves in the mirror of His Word. Because this is true. Amen. Amen. I can tell you this unequivocally. Every word of this is true. That's right. If you ever feel lost, if you ever feel like you don't know what's up and what's down, if you ever feel like you don't know what to believe, you can always come back to this. Because God's Word will forever be true. And God wants us to look into the mirror of His Word to see ourselves. Okay, It's easy for us to look around the world and look at the news and look at this and look at that and look at what's being said and look at... And point our fingers and say, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. And listen, there is a place for that, okay? I'm not talking about condemning people, but there's a place for us to speak truth in love because we love people and we want them to, to, to come away from things that are harmful in their lives. But Jesus is asking the church, and I'm not just saying our church, but I believe the whole church of Jesus Christ in the earth today, He's saying, look in the mirror again. Look in the mirror of my word. Make sure every spot, every wrinkle, every blemish, everything's gone. Make sure it's all taken care of. In other words, to the bride, make sure your hair is just right. Make sure your dress is just right. Make sure your makeup's just the way you want it. Make sure everything's in place and the way you want it to be when the bridegroom sees you for the first time. And that's what this is today. It's another look in the mirror. Or 15 minutes to go. Let's look at this passage together. Let's read it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning of verse 1 and reading through verse 5. <clears throat> but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. These are the words of the Apostle Paul and he's writing these to Timothy. You have to understand, Paul wrote most of what we call the New Testament. This is the last letter he wrote. Paul knew he was going to die soon. He actually was beheaded in Rome. He gave his life for the gospel. And Paul is warning Timothy and he's warning us about the last days. You have to understand this too. Paul believed he was living already in the last days. And that's not because he didn't understand the scriptures because he wrote most of these New Testament scriptures. He thought he was in the last days because he believed the truth that Jesus could come at any moment. Folks, that's true. Nothing has to happen for Jesus to come again. Nothing has to happen. There are things that have to happen before the very end of all things, but we understand and we know. We talked about it a little bit last week. There's going to be a gathering of the church to Jesus, and then there's going to be a seven-year period called the tribulation, and then the final end will come. And even then, it's not the final end. Jesus will return then, and He will set up an earthly kingdom then, and He will rule and reign on this earth then, and you and I will rule and reign with Him then. Okay? It can sound complicated at times, but it's not really. What we need to be concerned about is this truth that Jesus can come at any moment. He can come at any moment for the whole church and call us up quicker than I can snap. I want to let you know something. He can come for you or for me individually at any moment. You have no idea when you will draw your last breath. There are people who have lived their lives and they've said, well, you know, I believe what you're saying from the, the, the Scriptures, preacher. I believe 
Jesus died for my sins. I believe in the cross. I believe He rose again. But you know what? I'm just having a little bit too much fun right now. I'm not quite ready to settle down right now. I'm not quite ready to give up these things because they're just too much fun for me right now. I'll do that one day. I wonder how many, when we stand before God and lives are, are shown for what they were and people's lives are judged, I wonder how many will stand before God and that was their attitude and they waited one minute too long and they drew their last breath and they were gone. And once you draw that last breath, listen, if you haven't called on the name of Jesus, when you exhale that last breath, unless you call it on His name, you'll be lost. That's the reality. That's the truth. That's why these messages are important. Even if Jesus does not return for the church for 10 or 20 more years, which I don't believe it'll be that long. I really don't. I'm looking for, I'm telling you, I'm looking for it every day. I'm expecting it every day. I'm watching what's happening in the world. I've told y'all, turn COVID, turn the news off. Listen, I've been watching the news. And not just the, the pre-planned news that we get here, the propaganda news we get here in the United States. But I've been watching the news from around the world. I've been watching the factual evidence that's coming in and being reported from people all around the world. Listen to all the stuff that Jesus said would happen before the end is happening. And it's all happening at the same time. And it's all happening more frequently. It's, more, it's happening with an increasing uh, intensity. And Jesus told us, Luke 21, when you see all these things begin to happen, look up because your redemption is near. So I'm looking up. I'll make a confession to you. There's been a couple of Sundays that I have come to this pulpit and I didn't know if I would get to see you in this pulpit again because I really thought the time was then. That's how close I think we are. And that's why these messages are important. And so I say to you before we go through these things that I'm about to share with you, don't push this aside. As a matter of fact, I want to give you an assignment. And it's not my assignment. It's an assignment from your Savior, from your Lord. Take this passage home. Read it. Look at it. And see if you see yourself in the mirror of this Word. This passage is prophetic about our day. We all often talk about the end times. We talk about Matthew 24. We talk about Luke 21 and Mark 13, don't we? We talk about John 14 too, with the rapture of the church, where Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you and I'll come back and take you, receive you unto myself. This is a prophetic passage from the Apostle Paul. He's talking about the days that we live in. He shows us what people will be like in these days. And folks, I have to be honest with you, and I think you would have to be honest too, as we read that, doesn't that sound like what we're seeing in our world today? All of these things? Look at it again. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, lack of self-control, brutal people. How brutal is our world? Did you see the story last week? Guy ordered uh, DoorDash down in Florida. Did you see this story? He ordered DoorDash. And the DoorDash guy came to deliver the food. He didn't want any food. He just wanted a victim. And he killed and dismembered the DoorDash driver. That's brutal. Didn't know him from anybody. This is not, this is not about... I'm mad at you and I'm getting ready to take my vengeance on you. No, this is just brutal and demonic. Paul's describing the days we live in. These things are not new. There's always been brutality in the world. There's always been sin in the world. But they're increasingly worse than they've ever been. But folks, here's the thing about this passage, and this is one of the things that we have to take hold of this morning. These descriptive words are not just about the world, okay? Jesus described these things as well in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, but it's not just about the world. Paul and Jesus both were describing the church. How do we know that? 
Look at verse 5. He listed all those horrible things. And all of these things he listed were descriptors of a group of people. And then he added this descriptor in verse 5. They have a form of godliness but deny its power. Another version says they deny the power of God that would bring change in them. A form. They have a religious practice. There are people sitting in pews today. I pray it's no one in this room. But there are people sitting in pews and church chairs today who are there because this is what we've always done. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what mama and daddy did. This is what grandma and grandpappy did. This is what our family's always done. This is the church we've always gone to. But they are no more saved than the pew they're sitting in. Because it's a religious form. It's a religious practice. At the risk of you not ever coming back, I'm going to tell you, coming to church didn't save you today. You better be back next week. <laughs> it's talking about the church. They have a form of godliness. They talk about God. They talk about Jesus. They deny the power of God. I heard a story not long ago about a pastor in a church. And if you're on the outside looking in at this church, this church looks like it's got it all going on. They've got they've got a band. They've got a, almost a full house of people. They're, they're doing things in the community. But somebody came to me and unburdened themselves about the situation and told me the pastor's sleeping with women all over the church. Different women. And that's how. He has a form. He has a warped sense of grace. It's caused him to believe. I can do this. Jesus paid it all. Yes, Jesus paid it all. And he paid it all so that we can be set free from it. Amen or oh me. Amen or oh me. Many have a religion or a religious form, but they don't have what they truly have, and that's a relationship with Jesus. Listen, if you, here's how you know the difference. If you have a religious form, you came in here and you walked into this place and, and you had a sense of, okay, I'm at church and I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to walk out of here today and you're going to continue to hear His voice, not just in this room, but you're going to hear it throughout the day. And you're going to hear Him say, this is the way, walk in it, or no child, don't do that. Or He's going to bring to mind the things that God has said through the Word of God to you. You hear what I'm saying? If you have a true relationship with Jesus, it's an all day, every day thing. And it's a wonderful thing. Can you say amen? Amen. Paul here is describing the church. It's a picture of people in the church who do not know Him. And he describes a list of sins here in the church that are against God and people. Look at the list again. Probably one of the biggest ones here. He starts off with lovers of themselves. How many of you know that's the root of every evil selfishness. We talked about that in Cyprus this morning. We talked about 1 Corinthians 13. We talked about what love really means, the love of God that was being spoken of. We used the example out of the garden. When Jesus was about to be betrayed, He was in the garden of Gethsemane and He, he was agonizing. Yes, Jesus was agonizing. And He wasn't agonizing because the knucklehead disciples weren't listening. He wasn't agonizing because they'd fallen asleep and he needed somebody to pray with him. He was agonizing because he knew what was about to happen. He knew he was going to be betrayed. Don't raise your hand, but I know everybody in this room has been betrayed by somebody at one point or another. It hurts. Sometimes it leaves deep wounds. Sometimes it leaves horrible scars. Jesus knew he was about to be betrayed. He knew Judas was going to betray him for money. He knew that Peter was going to deny he knew him. He knew the rest of them were all going to run. He also knew, I'm going to go die for these people who are about to betray me. 
He also knew how he was going to die. He had been in and out of Jerusalem and in and out of Caesarea. He had been in and out of the major cities in the area. He had witnessed crucifixion. They crucified people up and down the roads leading in and out of the city to send a message, don't cross Rome. This will happen to you. It didn't take but six hours for him to die, but many of the people they crucified hung on crosses for days. Jesus witnessed that. And he was agonizing. Agonizing in the garden. Father, if there's any way, take this from me. But nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. That is great love. That is not selfishness. That is selflessness. And he wants us to be like him. But here's a picture of the church. Lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. People are out to get everything they can right now. Get as much as you can right now. Get all you can while the getting is good right now. Even if you've got to rip somebody off, just do it. Just do it. That's the attitude. And it's happening in the church. It's happening in the church. I saw a, a news story not long ago. It was another person that they come to find out had embezzled six figures from their local church. Six figures. I think it was $120,000 maybe or $220,000. And they'd just been quietly over the years taking that money, finding a way to do it where nobody would catch them, they thought. That was happening in the church. Proud people, boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Folks, I've seen that in the church of Jesus Christ. I've seen people come in and raise their hands and sing their songs to Jesus and weep tears before Him and then treat their mama like that. She was just nothing. Jesus says, if you want to honor me, treat one another right first. And then you come and you give me your worship and you give me your gift. Unloving and unforgiving. I want to tell you something. If you are holding and harboring unforgiveness against someone right now, you need to bring it to this altar and you need to leave it here today and say, Jesus, you paid for their sins too. Even their sins against me. We do not have the right to hold that over anybody's head. We do not. We have to let it go. It's not easy. It hurts. When people do you wrong, it hurts. And the natural inclination is to say, I've got to get back what belongs to me. I've got to get my self-respect back. I've got to get payback. And Jesus said, no, I died for their sins too. You let me take care of it. How many of you know, if, if you let Jesus deal with it, it'll get dealt with. Amen. Jesus knows how. He said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Don't you take it into your own hands. But yet there are people in churches... Who look for ways to take vengeance because they're dealing with unforgiveness. Without self-control. Boy, does that ever describe the world we live in. But it's happening in the church. I just told you about a pastor who can't keep his hands off the women in the church. Traitors, headstrong. Here's a great descriptor of the world we live in, but it's also a great descriptor of the church many times. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Listen, I'm, I'm not casting stones and I'm not going to name names. But there are churches today that are filled with people because they're being entertained. I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm never going to entertain you. If y'all find any of this entertaining, please let me know. Because I don't, I, I don't know how in the world it could be. When we gather in God's house, it should not be about entertainment. It should be about being with Him. And being with one another. And talking about real stuff like we're talking today. Because here's the deal. 
If we look into this passage right here and we see ourselves in any of that, we've got some business to do with God. We've got some things to do with God. We've got some things we've got to bring to Him and say, Lord, You've shown me in Your Word this is not pleasing to You. You've shown me in Your Word that You died for this and I'm still doing this. Jesus, I need You to help me. I need You to forgive me. I need You to take this out of me. Listen, God is the only one who can change a human being. If you think for a moment you're going to change somebody, well, it'll be alright. Well, I'm going to change them. I'm going to help them. No, you're not. It's not going to happen. You can't change them. Only God can. Only Jesus can. Paul's describing sins, but he's not describing the world. He's describing the church that Jesus died for. We're seeing all this happen today. The Bible calls it a great falling away before Jesus' return. Did you know that's a sign? That Jesus' return is close? Paul said it again in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. And then again, I think in 2 Thessalonians, he said it. He said there would be a falling away in the church. Jesus said it, Matthew 24. He said the love of many will grow cold. He's not talking about the love of the world because I'm going to tell you something. The world don't love you. The world loves your money. <laughs> the world don't want you. The world wants your money. The devil don't want you. The devil wants your soul. He wants to see you destroyed. That's the reality. He's talking here about the church. Paul's looking and seeing this in the church. Jesus, as it was recorded in Matthew 24, is looking down and he's seeing these things in the church. He's seen people betray one another in the church. Folks, we've got to get beyond that. We've got to get beyond these things. You've heard me say it before. It's not enough to say, okay, yeah, Jesus cross. He died for my sin. Yes, yes. It's not enough just to say, okay, yeah, I accept that. It's not enough just to, to, to make a mental note of that and an assent to that. We need to look into the mirror of God's Word and when it describes us and we see it in print and we see, wait a minute, this is God exposing me for who I really am. And then we look at the cross. And then we look at the fact that Jesus died for those very sins. My sins. Can I tell you something? The older I get, the more that wrecks me inside. When I was younger, it was about, thank you, Jesus, I don't have to go to hell. The older I get, though, I see his suffering and his agony, and it was for me. It wasn't for your sins. It was, but I can't be wrecked for your sins. I have to be wrecked over my sins and my life and my failures and my mistakes. And guess what? I'm going to be just straight up with you. I still fall every day. And I need his mercy every day. And that's the beautiful thing about a relationship with Him. You know, I've had people come and tell me, Pastor, I need to come to church so I can pray. I said, no, you don't. Jesus is right where you are. Amen. You don't have to be anywhere. Or let me say it a different way, a better way. You can be anywhere and call on the name of Jesus. All you have to do is look at the reality. Look at the Word of God and see yourself in it and see your need for Him. And let it wreck you on the inside to the point that you say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I want to follow you. Folks, that's what He wants us to do in these mirror messages. He wants us to look and see if there's anything there. Just like the bride on wedding day. Alright, 15 minutes. Got one last chance to look in the mirror. 
oh, wait a minute, that hair's out of place. Can you fix it? Oh, wait a minute. I need to put a little bit more makeup right there, shining. Oh, wait a minute. Can you get that steamer? There's a wrinkle right here, and it just doesn't look right. You hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what the Spirit is saying today? God wants us to come to grips with this passage. Because this is a picture of the church in the end times. He wants us to prayerfully look into the mirror of this passage and ask some questions. Number one, do I have a religion or do I have a relationship? Mm -hmm. You're the only one who can answer that. I had somebody tell me one time about their mother. Their mother had long since been dead and gone. This lady was very much up in years herself. And she came for some counseling. My wife and I would counsel with her. And she said, you know what? I really don't know whether my mother's in heaven or not. She said the people in the church thought she was because she knew just when to say hallelujah. She knew just when to shout and say amen. She knew all the words to the song. She didn't even need the hymn book. But the moment she got in the car, it's like a switch was flipped and she became a different person. And she began to cut with her words and she began to curse at times. And she just treated us horribly at home. She, he said, I don't know if she made it. Um, she said, I don't know if she made it. <coughs> She was saying she had a religious form. She wasn't sure she had a relationship. Which do you have today? That's an important question, but this one maybe is even more important. As we read through this passage, as you read through this passage, and I implore you, read through this passage again this week. Do you see yourself in this passage? When you read through this list, and you read through these descriptors of the people and the church of the last days, do you see these things in your life? Unforgiveness, slander, lack of self-control, despisers of good, headstrong, haughtiness, more interested in pleasure than interested in God. Listen, if you can ask that question and you can say, no, I don't see myself in this passage, then thank God for that grace because it's only by His grace and mercy. Amen. Yeah. Just going, I'm just being straight up with you. This passage describes every one of us without Jesus. Amen. In one form or another, we can find ourselves in this passage if we don't have Jesus. But by the grace of God, when you look at the cross, when you look at this and you see these things in your life and you say, Jesus, I know you died for these things. Please take them out of my life. Give me a new life. Jesus comes in and Jesus forgives you and Jesus cleanses you and he changes you and you're not the same person anymore. Do you, do you make mistakes from time to time? Yeah. Do you fail from time to time even though you're trying? Yeah. But you're a different person. You have a relationship with Him. If you can say, no, I don't see myself, then thank God for that. But if you look in this passage and you see yourself today, repent, please. And I say that gently, repent. Because you can do it that easily. Repentance is about changing your mind. If you see something in this list that's in your life, and you see, no, I shouldn't, that shouldn't be there. Jesus died for that. Change your mind about it and say, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I don't want to live that way anymore. And even if you can't change it yourself, say that to Jesus. Jesus, please change me. Please forgive me. Please take this out of my life. There are people sitting in this room who struggled with things in their lives. And they couldn't do one thing about it until they finally said, Jesus, you got to do it. And he took it away. God can do that for you too. If you see yourself in this passage, repent, change your mind, and ask Jesus for the grace and forgiveness and the change you need. Ask Him for a relationship. Ask Him not just to be in this room with you right now, but ask Him to walk out that door with you when you leave. Does that make sense? 
I'll say it again, whether through death or the rapture, every one of us is going to stand before God. Apostle Paul said it this way to the church at Corinth, and Apostle Peter said it as well. We need to examine ourselves. That's what these messages are about. We don't examine ourselves based on our own standard. And we certainly don't examine ourselves based on the standard of the world. We examine ourselves in the truth of God's Word. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads before Him in prayer. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just want to give people an opportunity to do some business with God. And this is between you and Him. If you're here today, and as we read through those things, you see yourself in that list. And you would say, Pastor, I, I want to change. I just need Jesus to do it. Just want you to slip up your hand because I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that hand. Anyone else? I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to do any of that. What I am going to ask you to do is what we've already said. Pray a sincere prayer today. Mean it from your heart. Jesus, I see this in my life. Your Word and Your Spirit has shown it to me. Lord, I want to be pleasing to You. Lord, I ask You to forgive me and change me. You pray that prayer with a sincere heart. And Jesus will do exactly what You've asked Him to do. And You will walk out of here a different person, free from that. Some of you are already praying. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank You for Your great love. Messages like this can be hard. But Lord, sometimes love has to do hard things. Sometimes in Your love, You have to confront us about the things that not only displease You, but they displease you because they harm us and they keep us from your best. Lord, for those that raise their hand today, Lord, as they are coming to you in prayer and repentance right now, Lord, I pray that you just lift the weight of that off their lives. Lift the weight of that guilt. Lord, lift the weight of that sin. Let forgiveness and joy flood their hearts. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you do the change. You make the change in their life. Lord, make them, make each of us more like You. Jesus, we need more of You every day. We need to be more like You each and every day. So Lord, that's our prayer. Help us as we not only look at this passage today, but Lord, as we read Your Word and we study Your Word and we meditate on Your Word and we see ourselves in the mirror of Your Word, Lord, I pray that we would forever be Checking ourselves, making ourselves ready, making sure everything's in place for your appearing because we do believe it will be soon. Thank you, Lord, for giving us not a religion, but a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Lord, as we prepare to leave this place, we thank you for our time together. We pray, Lord that your provision would meet the needs of all your people. We pray, Lord, that your protection would go with us into each and every circumstance. Lord, we also pray that your healing would flow in the bodies and the lives and the families of the redeemed. And Father, we pray that the peace, the peace of God in Christ Jesus would guard our hearts and minds each and every day. We pray these things in his mighty name. And let everybody say, amen. 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 amen, amen. Good morning. The Lord bless you. Greet somebody. Love on them as you leave the Father's house today.